In 2006, two teenage girls died in a mysterious car crash in rural Wisconsin. 18-year-old Amy Lynn Rademacher died within hours after the crash. 18-year-old Natasha Weigel died after 11 days in a coma. The driver of the car survived with brain damage. They were driving in a 2005 Chevrolet Cobalt. For years, the families of the girls attempted to learn what happened. They received some of their answers this week, when the CEO of General Motors was called to testify before the Senate over a growing scandal. In recent months, GM has recalled millions of cars after acknowledging faulty ignition switches, shut down engines and disabled airbags. The defects have been linked to at least 13 deaths and possibly hundreds. Internal GM documents show the company decided not to change a defective ignition switch redesign in 2005 because it would have added about a dollar to the cost of each car. During Wednesday's Senate hearing, the most hard-hitting questions came from Democratic Senator Claire McCaskill of Missouri, a former prosecutor who chairs the Senate Subcommittee on Consumer Protection. She criticized GM for what she called a culture of cover-up and said a GM engineer lied when asked last year about whether the defective part had been changed. A culture of cover-up that allowed an engineer at General Motors to lie under oath, repeatedly lie under oath. It might have been the old GM that started sweeping this defect under the rug 10 years ago, but even under the new GM, Banner, the company waited nine months to take action after being confronted with specific evidence of this egregious violation of public trust. Thousands of my constituents in St. Louis and Kansas City areas go to work for General Motors every day, building some of the finest cars on the road. I am proud of them, and I am proud of their work. This is not their failure. They and the American public were failed by a corporate culture that chose to conceal rather than disclose, and by a safety regulator that failed to act. To talk more about GM, we're joined by two guests. Ken Reimer is with us, stepfather of Natasha Weigel, who died in the 2006 accident. Reimer attended the GM hearings this week, was among the victim's family members who met with company CEO Mary Barra on Monday evening. We're also joined by Joan Claybrook, former head of the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration and president emeritus of Public Citizen. I want to go first to Mr. Reimer. Um, talk about what happened to your stepdaughter, to Natasha? Uh, the accident happened, uh, it was on October 24th. Uh, she was with uh, two other friends. Um, they took a little bit of a side trip from uh, where they live in uh, Baldwin or outside of Baldwin and just headed into a local town to just do a little bit of shop. And on the way back home from there, they, you know, as they on the side roads, not on the freeway, um, you know, only car on the road at the time. And they, you know, what we had found out through all the accident investigation, you know, the, the car had shut off, and within five seconds, you know, with the steering wheel locked, the uh, no power brakes, no power steering, and the airbags dismantled, um, they went over a uh, an adjoining driveway on the road, which caused them to go airborne. They they crashed through a uh, it was a telephone uh, box, and then it collided with a, a group of trees that uh, you know caused the extent of all the damage. And what did you understand happened at the time? Kind of all we knew at the time was, you know, that we we did know, like I said, the black box did show that the car shut off. Um, but we really didn't know why. We didn't have that answer why it shut off. You know, our, our assumption was, you know, you've got three teenage kids riding around in a car, you know, just about anything could happen. And so... Uh, and then, you know, Megan, the survivor, you know, with the damage, you know, the, the head injuries that she had and the extensive physical damage, you know, she was a, a long time recuperating. And, you know, a, a, we didn't get a chance to really talk to her very much after the accident. You know, I, she was a, uh, you know, she's got survivor's guilt, just terrible. I mean, it's, you know, obviously she survived, her friends didn't. So she always looked at it as the accident was her fault. And so she kind of, kept clear, you know, stayed clear from us. And actually, she moved to another another state even, um, just, to, you know, not necessarily to get away from us, but to just kind of, you know, she was getting a lot of uh, you know, accusations from her friends and that, you know, even just being in the area. So is your daughter, is Natasha, one of the 13 people that GM acknowledges, um, as well as Amy Lynn Rademacher, the 15-year-old who died? 
Are they two of the 13 people that GM acknowledges died in these crashes with their defective ignition switches? I, we haven't seen anything in print that, that justifies it or that says it exactly. Um, on our first taped episode that we did with, a, uh, with, with the CBS announcer uh, back in February, uh, the producer did call me uh, within a day or so after, you know, when we were putting the segment together and, and not sure where he got the information, but he did verify that this was at the time there was uh, six deaths involved, you know, when, when we first heard about it back in February. And at that time, he did call me and he told me that he did verify that Natasha was one of the six. So I would have to assume that Amy then was one of those six originals as well then. And when did you understand it was the ignition switch? Uh, I guess upon the recall. Well, we it, we had seen the uh, I had seen the the bulletin, whatever the uh, you know the service bulletin from GM. Uh, we had copies of that after the accident. You know, when we were trying to piece everything together to find out what happened, and with that service bulletin, it said that with a heavy keychain or a short driver, you know, the ignition could be knocked into the uh, the off or the accessory position. So we, you know, and the black box said that too, that the ignition switch did turn off within, you know, five seconds prior to the accident happening. So we knew the switch turned off. We just weren't 100% sure whether, you know, it was a mechanical or, or some other thing that, that could have caused it. But now knowing everything that we do, you know, from within the last two months, you know, just uh, all everything we've read, everything we've heard, everything that GM's putting out, I mean, it's, it's real obvious that it was the ignition switch, you know, went to the accessory position, shut off the car, basically. And, you know, that's that's exactly what caused that accident. Did you met with uh, Mary Barra, the head of GM? What did you say to her? Well, it obviously was just more of a, you know, we, we tried not to have it as an accusation, you know, uh, you know, pointing fingers. And, you know, obviously she realizes who we are. The whole idea was to put a face with with the people that lost their lives in that accident. You know, it was just, uh, we were hoping to get a little bit more just personal at time. And because, you know, she was a mother as well. And, you know, it was my, my wife's only child. So, I mean, it was just devastating. It has been devastating to her. And we just wanted to say, hey, Mary, you know, just, you know, this is what happened. This is what happened from what, you know, GM did or didn't do. And, you know, that was kind of the whole idea. You know, she gave a, a uh, a short speech when we first got there, basically to saying, you know, she apologized to each one of us specifically. And then from there, you know, she she mentioned as far as, uh, you know, she can't change what happened in the past, but, you know, she's putting every effort that she can to, to change how GM is, you know, handles things in the future. You and know, it, obviously, have you, you know, have you sued uh, GM? Um, we have filed a lawsuit. Um, I think it, it was filed about two weeks ago. Uh, in response to a question from Democratic Senator Richard Blumenthal of Connecticut, GM CEO uh, Mary Barra says she would allow her son to drive a Chevy Cobalt if he only had the ignition key. The uh, testing that has been done has been in on our proving ground that has um, extensive uh, capability where the vehicle would be jarred, and with the, just the key or the key in the ring, uh, it has it has performed. Is it your testimony here today that those cars are as safe as any other car on the road today? Again, def if, if, as you look across all the safety technology that is on vehicles from the past to present, there's variation on safety based on the technology that's on cars today. So there's variation with across the whole population. Is, is that Cobalt car, as driven now, safe for your daughters to drive? Would you allow them behind the wheel? I would allow my son and daughter to drive—well, my, my son, because he has, is the only one el eligible to drive, um, if he only had the ignition key. That was uh, GM CEO Mary Barra being questioned by Senator uh, Richard Blumenthal of Connecticut. Um, I want to bring in Joan Claybrook to the conversation, uh, former head of the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration. Major questions being raised about why the agencies uh, also did not regulate GM properly. Uh, but in the front page piece in the New York Times today, um, uh, Rachel Abrams and Danielle Ivory write, not only has GM twice adjusted the number of deaths 
Democrats that says are linked to an ignition switch defect, but it's also refused to disclose publicly uh, the list of the confirmed victims now said to be 13. Um, so we're not really clear if Natasha and Amy, uh, the two young women we were just speaking about, 18 and 15 years old, are actually even part of this list of 13, or if 13 is an accurate number. Um, Joan Claybrook. Well, I, I, without that information, we just don't know. Uh, my belief is that the call centers that General Motors set up about uh, three or four weeks ago with 50 people answering the phones have probably resulted in a lot of new information that we don't yet know about either. And so the number could be much, much higher. Uh, we had uh, families uh, come to Washington for a press conference to meet the senators and representatives and with Mary Bauer and so on. And uh, there were, I would say, almost uh, 13 deaths involved in our, with just our group. And that's not all the people that have uh, lost loved ones. So we just don't know what the numbers are now. What about the failure? Uh, go back to the beginning, as you've reconstructed it. Uh, you know, you've been head of a major transportation agency, and you, of course, have been a watchdog for so many decades. Uh, talk about what you believe happened with GM. Well, in terms of what the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration knew, uh, they, I think, really fell down on the job. First of all, they have some concept that is totally inaccurate, that you have to establish a trend in order to open an investigation of a defect, and that's just inaccurate. Uh, for years, the agency has said, if there is a design defect in, in a vehicle, that uh, can cause failure, and it's a critical safety part that can cause death or injury, that is per se a safety defect. And you don't, do not have to have body bags all over the, the highway in order to say we've, we've established a trend. Now, this was somewhat complicated because they weren't sure why the airbag uh, was not inflating initially. But as soon as they found out that the ignition switch was turning off, that was a very large hint. And uh, the agency complains that uh, it couldn't make a finding or even open an investigation uh, until it got more information from General Motors, which was not forthcoming. But I find that to be unacceptable, because the agency has subpoena power, uh, it has investigatory power, it has research and testing power, it has a lot of power. And uh, it really just didn't apply uh, the uh, capacity that it had. I, I would add that they have a very small budget. And so there's a lot of reluctance at the agency, unfortunately, uh, to open investigations that they don't see an end to. They don't see that it's going to produce the information that they're going to need. Uh, the, the agency has a $10 million budget for all defects across the United, entire United States. And that's less than Mary Barrow makes every year. So, and the whole agency only has a, a budget of $134 million, which is uh, a pittance. So, this agency is, is really handicapped, and I believe we're going to need some legislative changes in order to uh, both deter auto companies in the future and also facilitate the agency doing its job. Uh, Democratic Senator Claire McCaskill of Missouri questioned GM's Mary Barra Wednesday. Someone at General Motors had switched out the unsafe ignition switches in several car models and covered it up by using the same part number for the, for the same switch, for the new switch. The simple work of the engineer hired by the trial lawyer representing the Meltons had discovered the defective part and its replacement with the same number. And when Mr. Cooper confronted General Motors, Mr. Ray DiGiorgio, their lead switch engineer, with the evidence of the part switch, he lied. I guarantee you, if I'm a lawyer and I'm at a deposition where this bombshell has been dropped on my client, that there are two identical, two different parts with the same number, one of which is defective, I guarantee you I don't go back and tell the folks at the law firm, I'm on my cell phone in the lobby saying to General Motors, we've got a problem. So what I want to know is what investigation began after that deposition? That is part of the investigation. They were so you don't know whether or not anything happened after that investigation? I don't have the complete facts to share with you today. Senator McCaskill excoriated GM's Mary Barra for hiding key documents from family members. A key piece of documentary evidence in a litigation concerning a part that was changed without a part number change 
and that is spelled out in this document for anyone to read. How does that happen? I cannot, I don't uh, condone not providing information when requested in a, in a legal proceeding. And if that was done, uh, we, will do, we will deal with the individuals accountable for that. Well, I, I think it's very important that we find out how many cases this document was provided to counsel in when it was requested, as clearly within the scope. I guarantee you there is not a request for documents being made of GM around these cases that the scope of the request did not include this document. And I want to know how many cases they buried this document, because this is what happens in America. Corporations think they can get away with hiding documents from litigants and that there will be no consequences. And I want to make sure there's consequences for hiding documents, because this is hiding the truth from families that need to know. And it's outrageous. That was Senator McCaskill of Missouri, and she uh, helped The New York Times in identifying one of the 13 uh, victims um, that they believe are in that 13 list uh, who died as a result of the ignition defect. Um, I wanted to ask you, Joan Claybrook, Michael Moore wrote, I'm opposed to the death penalty, but to every rule there's usually an exception, and in this case I hope the criminals at General Motors will be arrested and made to pay for their premeditated decision to take human lives for a lousy 10 bucks. Um, can you talk about criminal liability here over these years? Well, we have been trying since 1966 to get criminal penalties into the Department of Transportation Safety Standard, uh, Statute. And uh, we've always failed because the auto companies have opposed it uh, vigorously. But I think that the time has now come uh, to put uh, a requirement that if an, an auto company knowingly and willfully um, covers up or refuses to disclose a safety defect or a non-compliance with a safety standard that uh, they're liable for criminal sanctions. And that would include uh, jail time as well as uh, dollar amounts. So uh, it's, it's really past time for that. Uh, the uh, Toyota case, where they also did a cover-up uh, with these uh, runaway cars, uh, uh, sudden acceleration cars, uh, the U.S. attorney, using uh, some power in the Justice Department statute for covering up documents, uh, f found a $1.2 billion penalty uh, for Toyota, but did not put anybody in jail. It is my belief that until some auto manufacturer employees whether it's the top or the middle or whoever did the cover-up, go to jail for allowing a, a defective uh, system to kill people that we're never going to have any understanding within the company of what, how th that culture has to change and safety has to be the number one priority. There are other things that I think need to be done as well, which is higher civil penalties. Right now, the maximum is $35 million. I think it ought to be unlimited with $5,000 per vehicle per violation. And that would, could add up to billions of dollars. And also, uh, we ought to have less um, secrecy at, uh, at the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration. It's a very secretive agency, does not like being criticized, so it makes it very difficult for the public, for the press, for consumer advocates to ever get any information out of them and to really exercise any oversight. So what we're talking about here are two major huge entities that are supposed to be devoted to safety, the Department of Transportation, the, the auto companies, and both of them have failed to do their job. The uh, NHTSA is not the cop on the beat. It is not uh, determined to find these defects. It has put some false requirement that they have to find a trend uh, in order to make a defect finding. That's totally inaccurate. That's never been the case in, in the agency until recently. And it ought to be abandoned, and they ought to look at what, if there is a design defect in a, in a, a vehicle, and it can happen, we know it can uh, occur, and it can kill. That's a per se safety de defect, and that ought to be uh, totally clarified. And then also, there ought to be authority for uh, challenges to uh, the failure or refusal of the uh, Department of Transportation to initiate a recall. That authority is not there, so they never feel uh, inside the agency that they're going to be challenged. Joan Claybrook, I, I just want to point out, General no. Motors was doing this as it was being bailed out by U.S. taxpayers. So it was right. knowingly killing the very taxpayers who were bailing them out uh, because they weren't willing to change a dollar ignition switch. 
That's correct. And so um, that's an, another uh, complication here, if you would, for General Motors, but it's really um, is very disturbing uh, for the American We public. only have 30 seconds. Ken Reimer, do you believe that uh, GM executives uh, and uh, uh, workers in the company should be held criminally liable for the death of your daughter? I, but they knew what was going on. They, they were aware that the, the switch was not correct. I mean, there, there's— and you know, all through the, the organization. I can't just put the blame on one person, but there's, there's many there that made that decision. And then there's also many more that made the decision to hide that. So, yes, I mean, they need to be held accountable for those decisions that they made and, and throughout the process, not just the guy that, you know, signed off the original paper, but, you know, his, his supervisor and, and all the way up the chain of command. Mm -hmm.